Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 462. That's 462. Cuatro seis dos. Cuatro seis dos. I think that's good. I think so. But regardless, thank you so much for tuning back in once again. Hope you are well wherever you may be. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review will help the show go a long way. Just log into your podcasting app and leave me a five-star or any star review. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated to help my podcast climb up the charts and up the algorithm and help me go up and help me get stuck. That sounds a bit gross, but you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, um, jam-packed show for you today as per usual. Loads of to get in on, loads of to talk about. Um, oh yeah, I've got to say as per usual, of course, if you want to support the Patreon, you can too at patreon.com forward slash Agostina for a little as one dollar, the equivalent of one pound per month. You get access to my bonus shows as well as my bonus content. So make sure you jump on there and do that. I've got movie reviews there. I've got bonus shows about stuff I rant about, you know, the good stuff over there. A little bit X-rated, a little bit no holds barred. So go over to the Agostino Zynga show. Um, on Patreon to access that at patreon.com forward slash Agostino that's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O get involved there today oh man oh god the day after losing a Europa League the, the day after losing a Europa Cup final and um, yeah man I'm feeling a little bit interest hmm interesting let me let me say interesting yeah, the day after losing a Europa League final is always a bit, you know, it hurts, right? It does hurt. But I have to be honest, man, like, it was sort of inevitable. As upset as I was yesterday, and now I've had some time to let the defeat marinate in my mind, it was somewhat inevitable that our season would end like this, especially considering how we went into the game. Right, our form was a bit all over the place. We weren't really playing great football. Our second in the league finish was a little bit deceptive. It was really and truly a false position. Anyone that's watched us play week in, week out will tell you that we don't play like the second best team in the Premier League. Um, we might have some really great attacking talent, but in terms of how we play as a team, we don't necessarily play as a team that you would expect would be second in the league. We basically dropped into the Europa League because we were unable to what get three points, I think, from like five games or something stupid like that. Or maybe one point. I forgot which one it was crazy amount in a pretty easy group if i'm not mistaken istanbul went on to get relegated i think this season in the turkish league if i'm not mistaken if not they ended up they ended up really really you know low in their um given league so it's not as if we like you know have earned our place in europa league we ended up there because we weren't able to compete with the top teams in the champions league and I was one of the rare people, rare United fans that wasn't really excited about us going into the Europa League. I didn't really ascribe to this idea, oh, it's a trophy. Oli just needs one, doesn't matter which one it is. Especially considering of how well we started in the Champions League. It was really, really disappointing how we ended it and we basically got knocked out and then we had to go into the Europa League. I'd much rather we just finished in our group fourth so we wouldn't have to go in there and just, you know, concentrate on the league and actually making us play better football week in, week out. But hey, you can only dream. But then once you're in the Europa League, you actually want to win it, right? And considering the teams that were left, it just made sense. You you would assume, considering the teams that were left, that we would maybe put our best foot forward in the final. You would assume so, innit? it? But that didn't actually happen for some odd reason. And the game was a little bit of a misnomer, to be honest. There's a I've got a screenshot here from Google. And for some reason, it has a match highlight recap of like nine minutes, which I think is probably a little bit too long for the actual game itself. I don't even think it was a nine minute. I don't know how they were able to get nine minutes worth of highlights. Maybe a lot of it has to do with the penalties, but it was a pretty diabolical game. I think Una Emery probably set up and Una Emery set up Villarreal very well. He just ensured that they were hard to beat. He just ensured that they were hard to break down. He basically allowed us. He basically sat deep, allowed us to have the ball on the wings. We couldn't really penetrate them and hurt them with our fullbacks. Luke Shaw is have, having a good season, but he's not exactly a rampaging fullback in a conventional sense. He's not going to take anybody on with dribbles. He kind of uses one-twos and overlapping runs to get past his players. So that's not really going to punish them too tough. 
Then on the right-hand side, you've got Aaron Wan-Bissaka, who just isn't good enough as an attacking fullback to play for Man United. The same reason why he's not good enough to play for England at the moment. We just have to kind of wake up to the fact that he's never going to improve his attacking output to the level that we need. He still can be a solid right-back option. Maybe he's probably one of the better right wing backs that exist because he can bomb up and down and he's solid in the tackle but in terms of being an actual conventional well in a modern day fullback that can get up and down the bar line contribute to play in the midfield or tuck in in the midfield when you know we're, we're, we're pushing people forward he's not that guy he just hasn't got the technical ability to do so on the ball so Una Emery's tactics were spot on he allowed Luke Shaw and Warren Wan-Bissaka and I guess that was Rashford and Greenwood to get the ball on the wings. And then it just they will just end up doubling up on them, especially Greenwood and Rashford when they got on the ball. But they let Shaw and Aaron Wan-Bissaka kind of have the ball for a while. Then when we got the ball in the middle, they didn't, they didn't basically ha harry and press us on the ball and ensure that our better players couldn't exactly turn and run at the defenders. I don't think Bruno Fernandes had a really particular good game, but again, he's not really the best player. He's not... He's not really a conventional number 10 in my in my head. I've always said, I see Bruno Fernandes more as an eight, a kind of a box-to-boxy type of midfielder, action-packed. He doesn't have the... I, I'd assume... This makes sense. Putting Bruno Fernandes number 10, I would say, is equivalent to playing Frank Lampard number 10. He might be able to do it, but it doesn't necessarily bring out the best in his attributes. It's probably better to have those kind of players rampaging up and, you know, all around the pitch, basically. But then having somebody else that can play that number 10 role, that can kind of receive the ball in, you know, not much space, you know, uh, use their body to turn and receive, dribble past players a little bit. You need somebody with good feet and stuff and dribbling abilities. And unfortunately, Bruno Fernandes just doesn't have that. It's not his fault, just is the fact of the matter. So, of course, he'd had a poor game. Then because we had um, Greenwood and Russia playing the wings, that meant we had to then put Pogba back in a double pivot and he had a pretty d poor game. I think of the midfielders, ironically enough, McTominay probably played the best out of Mc Pogba and, you know, McTominay, yeah. He probably played at the best of those two in double pivot. And people know my thoughts on McTominay. I think he's fairly average. So for him to play that well, this definitely says a lot about the level of performance. And yeah, overall, man, a pretty um, crappy game, really. Um, Villarreal ended up going, for, going ahead on 29 minutes in the first half with a pretty well-taken free kick. If I'm not mistaken, there was a couple mistakes leading up to that free kick, whether it was Eric Bailly giving away the ball or then Paul Pogba, which then led to the free kick. And the free kick itself, a lot of people are complaining about the defending from Lindelof, which I agree with. Lindelof isn't strong enough in the box, but you know who you're going you're gonna to get with him. When it comes to one-on-one -on -one duels inside the box, he's always going to lose the battle. Whether, and again, he has the weird thing. You remember there was a time and place where people used to say Chris Smalling used to really struggle against um, really aggressive, physical black strikers. That would be like a common joke in the United forums. But I get the feeling with Lindelof, anybody that just gets physical, it doesn't really matter about stature. Anyone that kind of ruffles him and pulls his shirt and kind of gets in his space, he always kind of gets, you know, unsettled somewhat. And in the box, when Moreno sort of peeled off from him and was, you know, um, Lindelof was, you know, struggling to get in front of him to block the ball. By that time, it was too late. He just struggled really, really hard. But to be fair, the ball inside the box was superb, superb. Like, the you know, the, the, the shape in it, it was sort of bending into the area, fell exactly into the five-yard box. And like I said in the, to somebody I was talking to on Twitter, that was a definitely a free kick that they practiced on the training ground. And then he saw after the game when Rio Ferdinand was analysing it, maybe on, in half time actually, he pointed out that, you know, Moreno made a run from the outside. He looked kind of disinterested. And then I think one of the other players sort of gave him a signal. Then as he ran in to, like, he, as he ran in to break the line, one of the other Villarreal players blocked our defenders, which then led Moreno kind of to, you know, saunter into the box unattended. And by the time Lindelof saw him, it was too late. The ball was already kind of on his foot half while he kind of finished it. And then we ended up getting back um, level second half with a pretty scrappy goal. We didn't really create much. We put good pressure on it, I think, in the second half. Like I said, people like Scott McTominay really stepped up. He had a, a couple of really good runs. And McTominay is another one, too, for me, who I think maybe playing alongside a better DM or playing further up the pitch. I've always said, I think, in front of goal, he probably seems like a really good option to have. He has obviously a good strike on him, can get in the air really well. He's big, he's physical, but he's not a deep lining playmaker. He can't play that role. He might be able to spray a couple, you know, 
20 yard balls here and there but in terms of having the passing range of the vision and the you know directness and just to kind of break the lines and stuff he just doesn't have it with his passing so I'd much rather actually have him playing further up again but again that would require our coach having the ability to recognize a player's strengths and create a system that brings out the best in them because I don't think you should really be playing McTominay that deep and expecting him to kind of dictate the game. He's not. But when McTominay kind of took responsibility and picked up the ball and started doing some runs, he looked superb, man. He was really, really good. A um, couple of good dribbles that kind of alleviated some pressure, got us up the pitch a little bit more. But in terms of creating some chances to the box or in, in front of their goal, non-existent. Bruno Fernandes was terrible. Again, like I said, this probably isn't a game for him. As soon as the team sits deep and limits space, people like Bruno Fernandes don't really succeed. He does that thing as well, which I've noticed where, you know that quick pass that he does where he gets it and just passes it straight away? I've kind of come to the realisation that it might be mostly due to the fact that he's not very press resistant, doesn't really have great pace and can't really dribble that well, right? So because of that, when the ball comes to him, he doesn't want to get tackled and dispossessed. So he's automatically looking for someone to offload the ball to. So it's not even like a, a system. It's not even a way of playing that where he's, you know, trying to craft and engineer the best possible chance. He just wants to get the ball out from his feet so that he can move to space and then get rid back again. Do you know that that regard? So it's a little bit, it's a little bit deceptive, the kind of balls that he does straight away around the corner. And usually they don't work. They're usually pretty horrible, those balls as well. And, um, Yesterday was a good example of it. Uh, Paul Pogba was a pretty diabolical too. Gave away the ball a few times. Looked languid in possession. Uh, maybe it was a position he was playing. Maybe it was just him stepping up again. Not so good. And Greenwood, Rashford. Rashford was terrible. Probably one of his worst games in a while. But if you watch United, you'll know that he plays like that all the time. But more often than not, he gets an assist and a goal and no one really says anything. But Rashford is pretty gash when it comes to playing out on the wing. Dribbling. Um, he had no joy against, um, was it Jose Foyt, whatever his name is, from Spurs that they've got on loan, who ended up looking like he had a concussion. He was bleeding from his nose. He had a tampon up his nose and he still pocketed uh, Rashford the entire game. Um, of course, Greenwood didn't have any joy either on his side. He had a couple of good runs, but not much either. And then, of course, Cavani was feeding on absolute scraps. He had a, a one chance where Luke Shaw cut into the area, looked like he was going to cross it, but he's actually a shot, and he tried to divert the, the header back into the goal. Just horrendous, horrendous, horrendous. And mostly, I would say, we always go into games, right, like that, mostly with the idea or mostly with the impression that the only way we're actually going to win is if our better players turn up. And I just don't think that's a good long-term strategy. I don't think Manchester United should be relying on the six players they have at front to really make something out of nothing for us to get back into a game. We don't start off games well. We don't play good football. We don't sustain actual meaningful attack. We keep the ball for keeping the ball's sake. We don't play out the back with any sort of system and idea of what we're doing. Um, it's just a shocking state of events. And one of the things that kind of annoyed me that doesn't make any sense really in the large scheme of things is bringing Harry Maguire and having him included in the, on, in the squad numbers, in the squad. Why was that needed? That's maybe a sign of just how far back we are in terms of a top team. Top teams don't do that. You have to be ruthless. If he's injured and he can't play, just leave him at home or allow him to travel with the team as like, I don't know, whatever it may be. Maybe because it was COVID restrictions, they wanted him to be with the team in case we did lift the trophy. But that's what it is to be in the top team. Sometimes you can't attend the trophy situation because you're injured. But then someone else takes your space in the squad. Why is he even there? It doesn't make any sense. Like he's a chili on the bench just to kind of G the boys up. Like really strange. When it comes to the lineup, I didn't really have any questions towards um, the players that uh, Oli Solskjaer picked in the end. I thought it was a fairly full strength team. Um, if anything, maybe Twan Zabi could say he was unlucky to not start. But again, I'm not too sure. Van der Beek was never going to start, even though he played really well in his previous game. It was never going to happen. For some reason, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer doesn't rate him. Or for some reason, Ole Solskjaer has this thing where if you're his favourite and he picks you, you're just going to keep picking those guys and that's it. So his rotation is pretty diabolical. So then when it comes to the time where you need to actually include these players, they don't have any rhythm. They don't have any form. They don't have any confidence to actually step in and do a job for you. They don't have it. So that wasn't ever going to happen. So... The team sort of picked itself in a way. If anything, then maybe I would have been a bit more, you know, ruthless and took enough Rashford at half time because he was getting absolutely no love on his side, whether it was just his inability to actually dribble past his defender or the defenders really being on game. That wasn't really happening. 
And then, of course, Greenwood wasn't really affecting the game either on his side. So maybe a rejigging of the players on the pitch, maybe including Ahmad and James, two players that obviously Solskjaer bought and has a lot of confidence in. Maybe playing them instead would have actually worked better. I don't know, man, but whatever we did wasn't necessarily great. I always had the feeling that Villarreal, even though they had less talented players, had a better system than us. They have a better way of playing, I thought, as well. If they had, I always imagined if Villarreal had the same level of position that we had and kind of quote unquote threats to the goal, they would have probably ended up scoring more often than we would have ended up scoring. They just had a system that worked for them, like even the free kick. They clearly had devised a route where they said, you know what, most likely Man United are going to have most possession of the ball mostly. I think if you look at the, the stats, let's see if you can see the stats here. They probably knew we were going to have more position of the ball. But here, look at that position. 61% to uh, Villarreal's uh, 39. And usually when you're playing a Spanish team and you're a UK side, usually it's never like this. Usually the Spanish teams always have really good possession. So for us to have all that possession is definitely um, partly due to the way we play and obviously Villarreal allowing us to have the ball. So clearly they had a, 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 a uh, system in place, a tactics in place where they said, hey, we're going to let them have the ball and if we get a set piece, we're going to make it count. And they did with the set piece that they had. They had another one actually that they did a little bit of a routine with that didn't actually go off well, but you could clearly see that they were banking on counterattacks and set pieces to actually get some goals. And look at even at passing stats. Villarreal 451 to our 692. Um, you could definitely see who was kind of trying to play football um, with passing and, you know, possession based and who was actually trying to affect the game in decisive moments, right? When it comes to free kicks and set pieces and all that malarkey and counter attack. So oh, I don't know, man. I think going forward with the future, I've never really been a big fan of Oli. I've always thought he was a pretty average coach. I think this is a good example of it. Unfortunately, we're in this position now as United fans where you kind of have to come to a realisation where you have to say to yourself, do you honestly think our f our quality of football will improve if Oli Solskjaer is given a blank checkbook and, and let to sign whoever he wants to sign? Because I don't think so. I don't think if you put Oli as a manager of Man City that they win the league. I think he's that bad of a coach that they want, don't win the league. That's what I'm saying. That's the difference that I think it makes. Some people will think differently, but that's the case. But okay, cool. let's get back to reality. Reality is, with the Glazers in charge, we're never going to sign the amount of players that we need to actually revamp this squad because I think it's a squad and a team thing. There are players currently playing in that team at the moment who probably don't have no business wearing the Man United shirt at all. So we need a lot of players, not just Sancho, not just Harry Kane. So if you're one of those United fans who think that we're going to be, you know, world beaters if we sign Harry Kane and Jadon Sancho, you are smoking the best crack in the world. That's not going to happen. We need, we need intense help. We need help from the start to the bottom, from the, from the boardroom to the training ground. We need to revamp everything. Um, Oli's coaching like he's if he stays there long term he needs to look at the play the people that he has on his coaching stuff like we need to really level up when it comes to remember Gary Neville saying we need the best in class and then we ended up getting a flipping John Burfu whoever his fucking name is to be the director of football who was who's been there since David Moyes' time at the club right to then be the you know our first foot director of football whatever it may be whatever his role is with his assistant being flipping Darren Fletcher who's got absolutely no experience in the role that is not best in class. That is obviously showing us and myself as a fan that United aren't really serious. We're not really serious about actually trying to achieve greatness and win the big trophies and compete on the big stage. And we know that now because we try to enter the European Super League with the players that we have currently now in that team. We want to enter the European Super League playing the way we played now, losing to Villarreal in the European League final. That's how we went to enter the European, League, the European Super League. Just imagine, just imagine, imagine. So I don't know, man, like no trophies. We finished second, terrible season. I think the second is deceptive. The points tally is probably a better reflection on how the season actually went. Um, the fact that Liverpool and Chelsea basically had a pretty horrible one-off season in their books. They're probably going to come back stronger. Arsenal will have another season under Arteta. Who knows what happens to them? Spurs might go out and get a big name signing of a manager who might revamp them. There's whole other things that are going to affect us position-wise, which we didn't really take advantage of this year. This year could have been the one we could have taken advantage of with COVID, um, with obviously the other, you know, uh, big teams in the league not really stepping up. The lack of competition maybe in the Champions League with, at the really high level. We could have really taken advantage of it and we didn't. We didn't because we're terrible. We're absolutely shocking. And um, 
anyone that thinks signings alone was going to change this is really, really delusional. And I, and I wish I could smoke whatever you're on because we are far, far from being a great team again. Like, how far are United from Man City right now at this current moment? Super far, I think. Very, very far away. Like, how many cycles do you think we have to go through until we're actually challenging in a meaningful way? Not like, oh, we're challenging in December. No, actually challenging. How many seasons more do you think? I'll give you maybe four cycles. Like, if we stick with Solskjaer, because I don't want Solskjaer. I want us to get... Because I think if we're going to have the Glazers in charge and they're not going to spend the money and they're going to um, effectively, every time we qualify for Champions League, I think the season after in that summer we always spend less money than we did prior so they spend a lot to get into it and once we're in it they don't spend anything so if that's the case we're going to need a coach who can do well with a shoestring budget who can coach players maybe a modern day version of what van gaal was trying to do maybe more expansive that's what we need as united we just need that at the moment because we don't have owners that are willing to heavily invest in a team like all the other big teams are. It's not going to happen. We're not going to sign players at a level that Chelsea do. We're not going to have two players for every position like uh, Man City do. It's not going to happen. It isn't. The Glazers have proved it over time. Couple of marquee signings to appease the fans to stop the protest. But overall, we're not going to be those teams that go out and sign four, six, seven quality players. It's not going to happen. We're going to sign a couple of marquee signings. Maybe, you know, drop a big load on Sancho. Uh, maybe attempt to sign Harry Kane and then, you know, take it to the last day of the transfer window and, and eventually not get him and then have to get somebody like, I don't know, whatever, some other striker who that we, no one really wanted. I guarantee that's what's going to end up happening. So if that's the case, we have to get a coach in who can bring the best out of the players that we have at the moment and coach them into playing a cohesive style of football. Because I think at the moment now, relying on Bruno, relying on Rashford, relying on Martial, relying on Cavani, Pogba, to just turn it on when they want isn't a recipe for, recipe for success. I refuse to say it isn't. It really isn't. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me know what you think in the comments down below if you're a United fan, how you're feeling. Man, I'm dejected, bro. I'm dejected because deep down, I just know it's going to take a while for us to ever get back to where we were prior. You know, football's moved on. We're just still languishing behind. We just only recently hired a director of football. Only recently have we got someone in place who's going to spec out the overall, you know, general vision of what we're trying to do as a club and I highlight the kind of players that we want regardless of the coaches that we have maybe specify what type of managers we're looking for only now have we done so only now so what what hope do i honestly think of us going ahead and challenging for the big honors i don't have any hope whatsoever zero zero but anyway what can i do man what can i do probably nothing uh, probably nothing what else we got here to me let's move on let's move on let's move on let's move on Bada bing, bada boom. What else do we have here? Oh, yeah, we got this. This is courtesy of Resident Advisor. Pretty cool news. It says Circle Loco partners with Rockstar Games for a new label, Circle Loco Records. If you're not familiar, Rockstar Games is the uh, game development company that makes GTA. They said the first EP features Seth Troxler, Kerry Chandler, Dixon, and more. Circle Loco has announced a new partnership with Rockstar Games, starting a new record label called Circle Loco Records. The new imprint from the Ibiza Party and the American video game publisher will debut with a compilation Monday Dreaming on July 9th, leading up to the full length release. The label will release a weekly series of EP featuring music from the album starting with the EP out on June 4th Monday Dreaming Blue EP spanning five tracks the inaugural release contains tracks from Kerry Chandler Art Girl, House Legend Seth Truxler Tech House Legend Ramper um, and Sama Abdullahi New New Legends and of course Dixon Atmospheric House Legend remix of Ditchkind or Dykind, yeah? Rockstar Games has been integrating dance music and DJ producers into their games for years, most notably in their Grand Theft Auto series, which feature the in-game DJ sets of Moody Man, Palm Strike, The Blessed Madonna, and more. Uh, music is fundamental to Rockstar Games. It's part of everything that we do, said Rockstar Games founder Sam Hauser. Partnering with the friends of Circle Loco is part of our ongoing efforts to find new ways of bringing the very best underground music to the widest audience possible. This is so cool, man. Honestly, think about the scope this is. If you obviously play GTA, you know how important music is to the whole experience of that. But it's obviously a great route for Rockstar. They don't have to go and license really corny commercial billboard music. They can effectively get some really, you know, cutting edge, interesting, 
um, very uh, fitting stuff that kind of if, is in line with what they do in terms of the games they produce, in terms of the how it actually flows. If you know you're playing GTA and you're hearing a mix over the radio on EP, that's exactly how you would listen to that music via your own car. So that's pretty good experience. And then of course there's the opportunity too for the artists themselves to gain a whole different new fan base, right? Especially when they do those mixes where they kind of uh, computerize the DJs themselves. You know, there's where there's uh, versions of it with Kinda Music. Dixon had one. I forgot who the other people were as well. A few other people in it had it as well, where they basically put them into the video games themselves and you see them mixing behind the decks and stuff. Like that opens them up to a whole different, whole different kind of group of people out there. And I'd imagine maybe there is. I would wonder if that happens, if there's a contingency of like um, video game streamers on Twitch and stuff who use DJ mixes as their background music instead of the mix, the music that is played on the game itself, because sometimes it's licensed and they'll take all your ad revenue or they won't let you upload it. I wonder if there's some sort of partnership with some people. That would be pretty interesting. Like imagine that podcast series called Hate, if they teamed up with a bunch of streamers and allow them to debut exclusive mixes as they're streaming the game or something or allow them to have you know um first call on the or some links on the ep when it eventually drops whatever it may be or allow them to then go and tip and sponsor and give money towards e artists that they like like that would be pretty awesome i think going forward so this integration is really really great obviously it'd be great to kind of maybe open it up to other people you know not so just the obvious names such as the ones mentioned on here but i also understand that these guys are where they're at for a reason they're at the top of the food chain unfortunately for some djs it just is what it is and the system is sort of rigged in that way or maybe it isn't this is maybe a meritocracy and these people at the top are there because they're the ones who command you know the biggest fees they sell the most tickets and they garner the most attention and they have the cues going around the block in it so maybe that's the vibe i'm not really sure but it's a legendary collaboration makes a lot of sense and is very fitting with what they're doing over there so i can't wait to see that go on next on the list we have the most important news of the day the one that i've been waiting to talk about something that's kind of really been on the tip of my tongue and i'm really really happy about this because god almighty what a lineup primavera sound have announced their lineup for the 2022 festival which has been postponed two years in a row now from what i'm uh if i'm not mistaken right obviously due to covid and stuff there was this understanding or hope that it would go through this year with the trial run that they did um, where they had basically people coming through at the Primavera site, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it was Sona. But regardless, someone that does Persona and Primavera did this festival, a trial run where they had people go to the festival sans mask and it was pretty successful. No positive tests and all that malarkey. And people were hoping, hey, they're going to put the festival on this year. But I'm assuming logistically, it just didn't make any sense rushing it. So they postponed it again for the second time to 2022. So there's a bit of a wait in terms of, you know, uh, going there yourself. But... God almighty, what a lineup. So this is news from Primavera Sound. It says, um, Alegria Primavera Sound presents the best lineup in its history for an extended edition of its 2022 in Barcelona and Sant Arabia, Sant Adri, Adri, how do you say that? Sant Adria de Besos. Sant Adria de Besos, right? Or de Besos. I think it's, uh, anyway, come in. Zoom in. The lineup of Primavera Sound 2022 Barcelona, Santa Andrea is not only the best in our history, it is uh, also the biggest. Um, it is the most eclectic, the most impressive, and the most stellar, the most primavera, the one that needs the most time to unleash in all its uniqueness, as revealed today through a majestic ad by Cupra on June 2nd, 2022. An edition will start that will absolutely be historic because it's something that we've never seen before. An 11 day urban festival with an exceptional lineup in which the whole city will be involved with six days in the Parque de la Forum. Um, plus a party on the beach at Sant Ari, Adria de Besos, the four days in the venues of Barcelona, um, an extraordinary addition that is explained by the combination of the two years without a festival that we've had to face and the, and the desire to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Primavera Sound as it deserves to be celebrated. It's made up of over 413 artists who will offer over 500 performances throughout the festival. Most of them perform only once, but some will perform twice and even more, shared over two weekends in Primavera La Cueta. 
la ciueta, la ciu, la ciu, ciueta, or however you say that. Um, we we will most we we must clarify the lineup is not yet complete and more artists will be added soon. Once again, the lineup for the pre Pre-Rest San Barcelona will be gender equal in line with the festival's public commitment to and will of course reflect the entire color palette of the contemporary music uniting the legends of music with the sensations of the moment and extreme metal with reggaeton references of discipline blah blah. blah. So the lineup itself, it is stacked, 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 absolutely stacked, right? Incredible. So the flyer itself is a bit confusing. It's a bit hard to read and stuff, graphic design wise, you know, it's a little bit of a trip. But when you zoom in, oh God, when you zoom in. So obviously they've got all the dates listed on here. They've got the first weekend, June 2nd to 4th, the second weekend, 9th of June to the 11th of June. And of course, some extra dates there for the 12th with some DJs. But let's go from the top to bottom, right? It is amazing. Maybe one of the better, best, best lineups I've seen for Primavera. And again, I've mentioned it prior, but Primavera is probably easily one of my favorite festivals out there it may be the most well-rounded um obviously going to barcelona one of the best cities in europe during june during the summer you know super nice weather great food great bars great culture there's a beach there you really can't make it up in it it's a really perfect venue so um headliners for june 2nd we've got massive attack pavement tame impala um then you know we also got supporting 100 gex bad girl black lips black midi um, Tangana, Charlie XCX, Opening Up, Cigarettes After Sex, Dinosaur Jr., DJ Shadow, Girl in Red, Honey D. John, Casey Musgraves, Kelani, Kim Gordon, Mabel, Big Up Mabel, Maria Del Mar Bonnet, Sarah Van Eaton, Yo La Tengo, and then continuing on, we got Afro Deutsch, Big Frida, Cool Super Back to Back with Shanti Celeste, Carista, Carla. DJ Frey, Faye Webster, Hannah Diamond, John Selly, Jesus Christ, the Shy Girl, Soto, the Armad, VT, VTSS Live. Okay, she's playing live. Interested to see her. I want you to see what she's going to do there. Um, then we got, of course, third, we got Beck and the National and the Strokes. Just imagine as headliners what that's going to be like hearing Beck, the National, and the Strokes playing in Primavera. It's going to be a vibe, mate. Oh my God. Amia, um, you got Bikini Kill, Brockhampton, Caribou, El Sweatshirt, Fontaine, Jimmy XCX. Again on the lineup, he stays getting booked in it. He stays riding the wave of the XX who have been relevant only what, a, maybe less than a decade ago, right? He's still getting booked off the back of that. Big up Jamie XX, man, like absolute legend. Jeff Mills, uh, Kano, King Gizzard, Lizard Wizard, Lil Sims, Manel, Paolo Vitra. Paloma Mami, Parquet Courts, Parquet Courts, Ways Blood. Ah, <laughs> oh, let's go, let's go, let's go. Aurora Halal playing there, some DJs. You've got Blawan, Carino, CSZZ, DJ Stingray. Wow, bruv. Georgia, Jessica Pratt, Jasmine, Mama Mia, Violet. And then, of course, on the 4th of June, right? That's a stacked first weekend already. The last weekend, uh, the last day of that weekend, Gorillas, Georgia Smith, who I can do without seeing live, but Gorillas and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds is going to be incredible. Bauhaus, right? Beach House, who haven't dropped an album in ages, but still is going to be sick. Um, Caroline Palocek, who's got a great album, what, two years ago that came out? Really good. Div, Disclosure, obviously always great. DJ Harvey. Right, my favorite DJ of all time, one of the best DJs in the world, somebody I've seen play maybe what more than six times. Incredible DJ, um, Dookie, Dreamcatcher, Idols. Oh, come on, man, I gotta go. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go. Jewel Box, King Cruel, Maria Jose, El Laguero. I've not heard of that person. Maybe Staples, Slow Tie playing. That's gonna be sick. Tyler the Creator headlining also. That's going to be live. Um, DJing wise, you've got ABBA, Automatic, Fo, Biscuit. These are all electronic artists, I'm assuming, right? Um, Fatima Yamaha, uh, Jane Fitz. Boo! Boo! <laughs> uh, Jenny Harville, John Geist, Kama Maslu, Lawrence Lado. Oh, wow! What uh um Rhapsody Caretaker Tim Burgess Tim Burgess that's um thingamajiggy right isn't that the same guy from uh 
What's that New York radio station is called again? Is that him? Or am I mistaken it? Stingray again playing. Terrence Dixon. And then on the... On the 5th and 8th. Jesus Christ, it's so stacked again. Oh no, this is a whole thing? Another one. Repeat. Beck, Disclosure, Interpol, JMS Georgia, Megan Thee Stallion, uh, 100 Gex, AJ, AG Cook, which is going to be cool. I'm assuming she, he's going to play a, a proper sick Sophie tribute set. Man, imagine Sophie, man. Oh, R.I.P., man. So, such a shame. Gone way too soon. Imagine Sophie playing at this in this lineup. Charlie XCX, Chet, uh, Chet Faker, Giles Peterson, Jenny Bev, John Talabot. Oh, come on, brother. It's insane. African Sciences, Alex Cameron, Automatic. Wow. This is a vibe. Wow. Then the following weekend, or the sorry, the, yeah, the following weekend, the second weekend, you got Dua Lipa, Gorillas, Interport, Tyler Cray headlining on the 9th, 10th, you got Lord, Massive Attack and Strokes. Lord hasn't dropped an album in ages. She's been MIA. Last time I saw a picture of her, she was out fishing somewhere. So that's going to be sick. Black Coffee's there too, Britney Howard, Burner Boy, Clyro, uh, Giveon, oh, come on, MIA, Nicola Cruz, Pasilu, Run the Jewels, oh my god, oh man, I just saw that, Playboy Carty's playing as well, oh my days, Playboy Carty's Slow Dive, Mole Grab, Metronomy, Perfume, oh, 11th of June, you got Judah Smith, Megan Thee Stallion, uh, oh my god, I have to buy tickets, man, I have to, I have to, innit? The good thing about Primavera too, even if the tickets get sold out, which they eventually will end up getting sold, I'm not sure if they're all going to sell out straight away because obviously it's a year um, in advance. You have to basically pay for them. But the main thing you should sort out if you are going to go to Primavera Sound 2022 is to get your accommodation sorted and maybe even flights. Flights, maybe not so much considering you're still going to pay about the same even if you book them now, I'd assume. So it's going to be that much. Even if you book them, you know, the same time, no, not me. No, if you book them maybe before February of next year, you're still going to get them in a fairly good price. But the one thing to really nail down is accommodation. It's super hard to come by. Because I think Barcelona, if I'm not mistaken, had the same thing when it comes to Airbnb that Berlin did, where Berlin basically um, prevented people from renting out places on Airbnb if they didn't own the homes, right? Because there was a real surge of that happening, which was driving, which was artificially driving up the cost of housing, I'm assuming, in Berlin. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not really sure how the details were. But if I'm pretty sure that might, that happened as well in Barcelona, so the housing is quite limited. And also because of the location, some people are like, it depends what you're into. Either you get a location, either you get a house or an apartment next to the, next to the actual venue, which is a bit further out, or you go and get your apartment in the old town, was it in the city center? Where was it the Gothic or whatever it's called, or whatever it's called, right? Um, where everything basically is, all the restaurants, all the cool bars and stuff. It depends what you want. So if you just go in there specifically for the festival, maybe get exactly next to the next to the venue, so you can walk home pretty easily. But I remember when we went, we had to kind of you know get on the bus or walk down or get a cab, and it takes ages to get back home, especially if you live in the main city of a bit. But God Almighty, man, I so want to go. I badly, badly want to go. That might be one of the best festival lineups I've seen post-pandemic, man. It's absolutely epic. They are celebrating a big way. And I think a lot of places are going to do really big lineups in the or next year because I'd imagine a lot of places that postponed them, there's probably some stipulation in the contracts where if you postpone this festival, you still have to book those people that you originally had on the lineup um, on the next one, if they're available, of course, right? And Because then, if you don't, then you obviously are liable to give them money. But if they cancel, you don't have to give them anything. So it's that kind of vibe. So a lot of those lineups are going to be artificially inflated because there's a lot of people that they had to kind of carry over from 2021. So it wouldn't surprise me if, like, for, for instance, Primavera, it wouldn't surprise me if the first weekend was maybe the original lineup of Primavera Sound and then the second weekend was what they basically added and said, hey, this is my new list of people, kind of to make it work that way. Um, and then, of course, you've got the middle dates, and then you've got all the DJs at the bottom. I haven't even mentioned, you know, a couple of business techno people that we could probably all miss out and stuff. But um, you've got who do I like here? You've got, obviously, Hector, o Hector Oaks, Nicola Cruz, uh, Anika Kunst and Malika but the rest of them you can kind of count out you know who cares about seeing Peggy who plays somewhere like come on but yeah it's a vibe man it's a vibe cannot wait Primavera Sound tickets I think go on sale Friday tomorrow so if you're in tune of course go out and get them if not you're definitely going to miss out you're definitely going to miss out 
Next on the list, we have news courtesy of Sky Sports. Tyson Fury vows to smash Deontay Wilder after signing the contract for a trilogy fight. Um, it says here, Tyson, Tyson Fury has vowed to smash Deontay Wilder. Um, Britain's WCBC, WBC champion was ordered to, by an arbitration court to face Wilder next, disrupting plan for an undisputed world title clash against Anti Joshua. And Fury has now officially agreed to a trilogy fight, which is quite funny, isn't it? Yeah? Somehow, I don't know why they thought it was a good idea, especially if they knew what the contract was saying. Um, Tyson Fury's team and Andrew Joshua's team thought it best to just, you know, leapfrog over Deontay Wilder and organize their own fight because obviously they're meant to be fight. For, they're meant. They're meant to be. They've. They have meant to. I might just mess up my words for. They've meant to fight for a long time, but it never got organized, and they kind of finally, you know, after all the bickering online, they put pen to paper. But then I guess Wilder has always kind of taken the loss against Tyron Fury, Tyson Fury, sorry, really badly. He hasn't really accepted the circumstances around it. He's made every excuse under the book, whether it's to do with his costume, alleging Tyson Fury has soft stuff in his gloves. But regardless of the fact, he still, to this day, is kind of, um, you know, resistant to being a kind of gracious loser. He's definitely in his head made this idea that he didn't lose circumstances made him lose right but he didn't lose to a better man he still thinks he's got a chance of winning it and i guess in the original contract they had some sort of stipulation that basically said they could have a trilogy fight and that would be a trilogy fight that i guess couldn't be interrupted you have to kind of have it back to back and um but people just assume because fatata fury smashed him so much that he was just going to step aside but i guess you know wilder definitely thinks he can win which i don't necessarily think is true i think we've seen the best of wilder i think in terms of his power, it's going to be obviously it's a freak, freaky power that he has in terms of being able to knock people, knock people out and turn the lights off. But in terms of actually being able to box and stand behind his jab, he just doesn't have that discipline or that patience to do so. But I have seen footage of him training recently, and he does look pretty good. He does look pretty boring. He does look pretty methodical and pretty much um, like what you'd say a conventional boxer looks like. Whether or not he can implement that into his actual fights and not get sort of rush of blood and kind of come out with his arms by his side and throwing, you know, big looping right hands or whatever it may be and uppercuts and stuff is another thing. But he honestly thinks he can win. He really, really does think he can win. And maybe, of course, that's part of a, a fighter's makeup and mindset. You kind of have to be a little bit delusional to be a, you know, a fighter of any sort, you know, boxing, MMA. You kind of have to have this idea that you are the baddest man walking the earth and you can knock anybody out because why else would a, would a sane man with any sort of logical mind want to go into a ring or face somebody else to fight? It doesn't make any sense. So you kind of have to be a little bit delusional. But so from seeing what we saw, Tyson Fury in that ring against Deontay Wilder, it's not really looking optimistic. It's not really looking... The odds of Wilder winning aren't really high, are they? If you think about it. Um, is it well, they're not good odds anyway. That's what you'd say. So it says here... Fury had stopped Wilder in the seventh round to claim a WC belt last February, but the Alabama, but Alabama man activated the clause for a return and they will resume their heated rivalry this summer. Jesus Christ, going to be wicked. Said, Wilder, this contract is signed, told top rank personal team, you're getting smashed. When I say smashed, I mean smash, smash, bang. You're getting knocked out, end of one round, you're going, I've got your soul, your mojo, everything, which is obviously a big deal because of how he smashed him, but I would just... It would just be like boxing, right? It would just be like fighting for Wilder to go in there and knock Fury out because of the arrogance that they had as a team that to think that they could just leapfrog him. Okay, you beat the guy, but at least discuss it with him first and find out if he wants to step aside. But the fact that they just publicly went ahead with the match between Fury and thought Wilder were just going to step aside, it would just, you know, karmically, you just know Wilder's just going to come in, smoke uh, Fury reject any sort of rematch of Fury, walk off to the sunset and say, I'm the baddest man on the planet, and then go and knock out Joshua. You know that's going to end up happening, isn't it? You know it. And if there's one person who you'd think, this is maybe a weird thing to say, if there's a person who you'd think Joshua would probably be able to beat in a boxing match, it would be Tyson Fury. Like, boxing to boxing, people still think maybe Fury's better. But when it comes to a one-off fight against Wilder, it's the flip of a coin, what happened. I can still see Wilder kind of, you know, landing some killer blow and, you know, discombobulating Joshua and having him wobble and stuff, right? I can still see that happening. So I say it's a, probably the worst scenario ever for Wilder to win this rematch, but I can definitely envision it happening. <laughs> he says, you're getting smashed. When I say smash, I mean smash, bang, um, gun. You're getting knocked out in round one. End of, I've got your soul, I've got your mojo, everything. Unified champion Joshua must overcome um, all... Uh, 
Alexander Usyk to preserve a to preserve a postponed fight against Fury to decide who's number one Fury fighter. So there's, there's so much riding on this, right? Joshua has to beat Usyk. If he doesn't beat Usyk, then he doesn't face Fury. But Fury also has to beat Wilder. Oh, uh, the WBO has ordered Joshua to defend his bout against mandatory challenger Usyk, issuing a 10-day period to strike a deal before the purse bids uh, are called. According to my knowledge, AJ is already is ready to take the challenge. Usyk promoter Alexander Khrushchev told the Sky Sports it may happen anywhere, including Wembley, but yet no serious venue commitments have been made. The Usyk fight is expected to be staged in August with Joshua and Fury promoters hoping to reschedule the undisputed bout in December. Wow, they're really trying to bang this out this year, isn't it? They want to get that fight out the way in July and then their defences or the rematches in terms of Fury's case and then fight each other in December. Quick turnarounds, isn't it? Quick turnaround. So let's see what happens, man. But again, it wouldn't surprise me if Wilder ends up winning this rematch. It really wouldn't surprise me. It really wouldn't surprise me at all. Next on the list, we have this pretty interesting article courtesy of Business Insider with the CEO of Shopify, who said some things that I kind of resonate with, especially coming from a startup background and working in companies, large and small, and corporations. I've worked in places where there's five people, a place where I'm the 20th hire, a place where I'm a team, where I'm in a building full of, you know, of 500 people and a team of 100 people, where I'm very insignificant. I've worked in all types of places, right? Big, small, retail, bars, all the, all the malarkey in between. So I've got a good handle on kind of, you know, what some of the most annoying things are in the whole startup land. And one of the one of the more annoying things working with in startups is this idea that they have where you're all some sort of family, right? Where you're not just working a job or you're not kind of, you know, what um, the CEO of Spotify said here, or sorry, the CEO of Shopify said here, where it's more so of a sports team that he kind of wants to imbue in his company. But most companies want you, in order to be committed, committed to what they do and to go the extra mile they kind of put this idea out there this notion that you're somehow some kind of family when you're obviously not you're there primarily because you want to exchange your time for money but secondly of course if you can find a place that aligns with your you know um with your ambitions with your goals in life maybe your interest that's also a bonus but on top of but the main deciding factor is this idea that you're willing to exchange your time for money but then the most effective way to kind of empower, I think, your employees to get them to do the extra mile is to treat them more like a sports team as opposed to this idea that they're a family. Because with a sports team, it's not like you are, you know, you're in love with the team you play for. You're a professional, so you obviously you do your best job. But you want to be, you want to do your best job so that you can be the best teammate for the people that you're in a team with. Do you understand? So you kind of want to put your best foot forward because you know if I do my bit, that's going to make... The next person next to me job easier, which is going to make that person next job easier. It's kind of like a domino effect. That's kind of how you want to rally the troops, as opposed to a family. Like there's a, you know, a family which you don't have any, you know, which you don't have any option to be born into. You kind of have to love unconditionally. That is not what you happens in a company at all. And there's some weird rules that they have in startups. So they always do that. Every anytime you go to a startup and they have a oddly two stocked kitchen you know, with all the best snacks in the world, they have an amazing game room, they have all the best sort of like, um, you know, end of week parties and quarterly meetings, you have to really, really be cautious, because usually, if they're spending too much time getting all those extracurricular, extracurricular stuff right, it's usually some, and it's usually kind of a way to mask over some of the day-to-day -day hassles that you're going to have working in a place like that, whether it comes to them not paying you on time, whether it comes to your role being a little bit vague and not, not having set K or KPIs keep moving and, you know, the, the bar of entry keeps going up and down. Like, there are some definitely red flags out there if you start in a startup and there's too many snacks and snooker tables and, you know, people around playing happy sack in the flipping patio and stuff. It's always a red flag in my experience. So it's really great to hear the Shopify CEO say the following, courtesy of Business Insider. He said, read the essay Shopify, Shopify's CEO sent to managers to remind them they're a sports team, not a family. It shows a growing tension between leaders and employees in a corporate world. It says over the past year or so, a debate over the role of that company should play in its employees' lives has played out in the corporate world. While some workers have high expectations for how their employers should be engaging when it comes to social issues, companies are uh, sorting through how to best respond while staying focus on their business which is the main thing all the social justice stuff you can do in your own time right but the main thing is for you to contribute to the bottom line of this company to make sure the lights are on so that you can get paid 
right? And of course, if it aligns with your passions and your goals in life, cool. But this whole imbuing politics and, you know, treating it like a family and extension of your home, it's not the thing. You go, you do your job, you be professional and you go home and you do it again and again and again and again. You turn up, you turn up, you turn up, you turn up, but not because they're your family, because they're your sports team, continues this has been heightened by the COVID-19 pandemic which has been which for many has blurred the lines between work and life in general a group of more than 400 Google employees announced that they'd formed a union that would focus on ethical issues and create a structure for work activism um, in September Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong wrote a letter that said the company would not engage in societal issues great unrelated to our core mission because we believe the impact only comes with focus 100% singular focus and singular drive especially in the company is one of the most satisfying things to see when you start at a place and you see the founder has his head screwed on and has a great management team and everyone you're working with and your little team as well knows what they're doing and they're driven and know what to do it's so unique it doesn't happen a lot because sometimes there's a lot of losers and you know kind of you know crappy players that are in your team together with you but sometimes you can join a company where everyone is just such a killer it makes working so much easier and it makes you achieving your goals and your targets that much more sweeter it really really does and then that way if your manager then goes hey here's my card go to the bar in the corner and have a couple of rounds on me that pint is so much more sweeter than your manager inviting you to go to miami and stuff all this glitzy stuff like that glitzy stuff usually is a mask for crappy practices day to day but sometimes just having the ability to order a pizza after hitting your target on a friday is much sweeter than go doing these extravagant uh you know um uh things where you go you know on these flipping hikes and stuff it's just un unnecessary in my opinion super super unnecessary uh la, la, la. focus coinbase offered severance packages to employees who did not agree and 60 people took the company up on it the software company Basecamp initiated a ban on political discussions in april which led to the bar of at least 18 employees imagine leaving a company because they don't want you to they don't allow politics to be discussed on slack Imagine how pathetic that is. Like, what? In August, Shopify CEO Toby looked, um, sent an email to managers uh, outlining the e-commerce company's stance on leadership and social justice issues just a few weeks earlier. An internal debate had erupted over the discovery of a noose emoji on the Ottawa company's Slack system. Oh, the things people get annoyed by at work is just annoying, which some employees had dis disturbed them. Some employees said that they also upset about a video that a team at Shopify created called the 10 Slack Commandments, a riff on Notorious B.I.G.'s 10 Crack Commandments. At the time, protests over 25th, May 25th killing of George Floyd were taking place. So what? So they somehow tried to link the fact that they made a parody of the 10 Sack commandments biggie to the killing of an unarmed, unarmed black man at the hands of police isn't that actually more racist the fact that you can somehow link the fact that they said 10 Sack commandments with the biggie song i don't know super 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 pathetic in the wake of the initial debate Looks at how you or Luke changes the settings on the Shopify diversity focused Slack channel called Belonging to be read only, further upsetting some employees who told Insider they felt silenced. Look at August's email to Shopify managers clarify the stance. So let's actually read his man, his email, right? The CEO says the following Leadership is tough. Leadership through times of crisis and ambiguity is doubly tough. Leadership through times of multiple compounding global tidal waves can be impossible. To refer back to my summit talk, Shopify is a is in a new box that we don't understand yet. The world is in a new box that we barely understand yet. Um, we've uh, we've only mapped out a small corner of this box and we've just started exploring the rest of the vast dark patches. It will take some time. What's more, our team members need us more than ever. The best thing that we can do for them is not to add to the ambiguity. Shopify hasn't historically been great at setting clear expectations across the organization. And I think this is starting to cause some enormous amount of managerial depth that's ballooning out of control. I like that, right? An acknowledgement that, hey, maybe I haven't set the parameters straight here, but I'm going to set them straight now. So no more ambiguity, no more hazy ideas of what we're doing. This is what the deal is. Laying the law down. Like, I love when it's like proper authoritative direct sort of managers and ceos and companies to sort of say it how it is and let you know where you stand as opposed to the wishy-washy everything's okay i'm gonna walk around the office barefoot thing i much prefer this approach it continues i can tell you that to do that in our various departments i, can, I can't tell you to do it in your various departments but a good start would be to remind everyone that we are a business more importantly we are a hugely ambitious one we are trying to create a world-class product that gives uh let me get some text is coming up on my screen sorry move away um 
We're trying to create a world-class product that gives superpowers to merchants and we are obsessed over. Everything Shopify does is, to, uh, does is to accomplish this. And everyone at Shopify should be able to describe how their job through a series of direct or indirect steps furthers this mission. To help make this more clear to our team members, here are some pointers about what Shopify is not. Shopify, like any other prof... No, uh, a Shopify, like any other for-profit company, sorry, is not a family. The very idea is preposterous. We are born into a family. You never choose it. They can't really unfamily you. But it should be massively obvious that Shopify is not a family. But I see people, even leaders, casually use the terms like Shopify, yuck, which calls the members of our team, especially junior ones that have never worked anywhere else, to get the wrong impression. The dangers of family thinking are that um, are that it becomes incredibly hard to let poor performances go very good point shopify is a team not a family so if you're not performing in this team then you will get told to skedazzle because obviously if you're a family it's basically impossible to fire your family you've all watched gordon ramsay's kitchen nightmares you know how bad that can get it continues we literally only want the best people in the world the reason why you joined shopify because i hope all the other people you met during the interview process were really smart caring and committed this is magic and it creates a virtuous magnetism on talent people because very few people in the world have this in themselves people who don't should not be part of this team this magic and this magnetism is a product of the tight performance management that i expect all of us to get to back to shopify is also not the government we cannot solve every societal problem here thank god we are part of an ecosystem of economies of culture and of and and uh, and of actual countries we also can't take care of all uh, all your needs we will try our best to take care of the ones that ensure you ensure you can support our mission shopify's worldview is well documented we believe in liberal values and equality for opportunity sometimes we see opportunities to help nudge these causes forward we do this because this directly helps our business and our merchants and not because of some moralistic overage you hear that we do these things because it helps the bottom line not because we're great people we're a sports team get that in your head we we want to build one of the best companies in the world we obsess uh, about our merchants we want everyone to have a shot at bettering their lot through entrepreneurship we want to make and keep shopify the product world class or die trying how can you read this and not be infused about working at shopify this is a great rallying call right that's the kind of thing that you would say you know on a tannoy somewhere and everyone be like who 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 right that's what you basically say it continues um only way to do this is through um having difficult incredible people some of them we hire on future potential and we help them but they expect them to grow into their potential some of them we bring in we bring in further down their careers but we all have to re-qualify our jobs every year the red queen oh really they have to re-qualify for our jobs every year the red queen race of shopify's historic 40 percent or better growth is that everyone has to show up at least 40 percent better every year to qualify for our current job that's impressive, isn't it? You don't just get a job for life after you pass your probation. You have to keep justifying your position by good performance, as a sports team does. Um, I expect you to hold yourself and your teams to be to the standard. Judge this improvement based on having a growth mindset, deep in the craft, taking risks, making better decisions, and doing what it takes to better support our mission and our merchants. We will always have the compassion for our team members in truly difficult positions. For example, those who find themselves suddenly becoming primary caregivers or those who are struggling with mental health issues. There are also second chances, especially for those who have been top performers before. Outside of those cases, we need to remind everyone that like any other competitive sports team it matters how you show up every day and contribute to his team success beyond straight performance output everyone that engages in endless slack trolling victimhood thinking and us v them decisiveness and zero-sum thinking must be seen as a threat as they as a threat they are and they break teams teams survive and thrive on the action of the collective and the cohesiveness of the whole poor performance and decisiveness cannot be tolerated i love this um if this is sounds all so surprising this is because we somewhat lost something shopify has always been like this i feel like a lot of these uh, core beliefs have been muddied over the recent years so in my capacity as of one person who has witnessed every minute of shopify's existence i want to reiterate some of these core principles shopify as successful as it is right now precisely because of the downstream effects of these early ideas currently we are successful despite the muddying this will not work for much longer let's get back there despite 
all of the external buzz around Shopify, market cap, biggest company in Canada. We still really, we're still really early. Um, we are in the big leagues amongst the biggest and baddest companies in the world. When we succeed in our mission, millions of merchants do better. Millions of people find employment. We have the opportunity to make that tens and even hundreds of millions of in the future. I'm here for, for I'm here for this potential, and I need you to be here for that too. Okay, that's a lot to take in. You might be tempted to take what's out there and run with it in some kind of low pass filter and translate into your own language before that section with your peers and your leads. Don't. Above is what I need everyone to understand. It's important not to muddy a message that fights against the muddying of principles. You're responsible for reinforcing these lessons and holding your teams accountable to them. The talent team will follow up in the next steps in the coming days. Even better, actively help them with ideas and opportunities to implement those ideas. This is what leadership in action looks like. That is incredible. <laughs> Shopify CEO, well done, mate. Top man. Top, top man. That's what you want to hear from a company, a rousing, a rousing rallying call for you to perform and do your best. Next on the list here, what else do we have? 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 Is that what you have? Well, we're an hour in already, isn't it? Maybe we'll end there. We're an hour in. We're an hour in. When our entry in there, should we do what? Let's just do one more. Let's just do one more for the vibes, for the vibes, for the culture. So, last news of the day before I let you guys go is the following. This is courtesy of Hype Beast, Jound, Justin Saunders, Jound Studios, whatever it may be called, Jound Atelier, I'm assuming, has put together the second, if I'm not mistaken, Vans collaboration. Um, they've now decided to go with a skate mid, which I'm a little bit meh, underwhelmed by, to be completely honest. It's not my favorite model that Vans have, have out there. Obviously, this is coming from the success of their Vans Old School, which was one of their better collaborations I've seen in recent years, one of the, maybe the best re recent Vans collaboration, especially considering how much they go for on StockX. I think everyone else thought the same as I did as well. So they decided to update the silhouette and go with the Vans Skate Mid. I'm not really a fan of the model. Like I said, I think the shape is a bit odd. doesn't really look that great on feet. Um, I think usually if you're going to go with a skate high, just if you're going with a skate model, just go with a skate high. The mid is a bit of a misnomer. And if you're going to go with this shape, I think a half cab or a chucker works better. What's happened to chuckers, by the way? Why don't people make collaboration with chuckers anymore? They were probably one of the most... Um, often use shapes in terms of collaborations outside of Supreme. Obviously, they did loads of Vans Chuckers, but it seems that no one does Chuckers anymore. I wonder if it's to do with Vans phasing out that model, if it's to do with the consumers maybe not buying it as much, which I don't agree with because I think loads of people buy Vans Chuckers out there. But I'm a big, big fan of Vans Chuckers. It may be one of my favorite models outside of the half cab. But this is fairly great in terms of colorways. I like the all black, obviously, with the white sole. Um, you've got the sort of khaki slate colorway. Then you've got the classic olive i'd say from jound that's what you basically know them for with the contrasting laces on there so fairly decent looks here let's see if they've got any more information it's been um it's been just over four years really since the mysterious but popular imprint jound kicked off his footwear collaboration with vans with a trio of old school texas four years ago i didn't know that um all of which now find themselves priced over one thousand uh, on a secondary market following the foot similar projects imagine paying 1k for a pair of vans old schools let me actually see what they like jound uh jound uh vans because they're going for 1k on StockX. that is wild brother absolutely wild 1k the best color of course is the green or the brown actually the brown's pretty tight as well the brown definitely looks quite um old school and pretty, especially when it's got the little old school hang tag on it too um with the i think it's got a jammed logo on it as well on the outside if i'm not mistaken i'm not sure if there's much iconography or branding on them or maybe there's one on the tongue it doesn't it shouldn't matter really but if you're going to pay the 1k on resale you'd want a little bit of a you know you want some embossing or something on the side there so yeah, this is the this is the green pair currently on StockX. um what does it go for here it doesn't really have a price in my size it looks like does it oh why is it it's gone off screen there but it was i think it was a thousand let's see if it loaded up ba, 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 ba. come on hurry up oh that's why for some reason it did that come on go away come on where are you it's like it's so hot there you go okay cool so not really have a price on these at the moment 
But what we have is these. What's the price they went for? The last price, let's see here, view or ask. Obviously in size 11 that I'm at. No available information, really? No way. So they've not sold any. That doesn't make any sense. View all bids. Okay. That doesn't make any sense. How much are they going for? Bid, 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 view, view, view. Yeah, let's go US all. Okay, you can get a size, view available sales. Uh, size 7 is going for £318. Still a lot to buy for a pair of vans, right? Which look pretty basic in terms of colorways but it's really really nice and then you've got the browns of course which is this one they go oh the browns are the most expensive one a thousand look at that that is wild last sale was 406 okay maybe there's some discrepancy between the overall sales and the price of it but still um yeah let's go back to the text it says here uh da, 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 following the photo projects with the likes of new balance and rebook the brand helmed by justin saunders appears to be reuniting with the anaheim based skate label as his teaser's forthcoming skate like mid capsule that's another thing too that i like what they're doing similar to what hiroshi fujiwara my idol does where he collaborates with various brands right i like this idea that he's basically done some because i'm assuming if john tries to do a nike collaboration they're going to want him to sign an exclusivity deal which is annoying but i like the ability to be able to because i guess they're not competing brands vans new bands and rebook so he's able to kind of do collaborations with each of them maybe that's why the dis maybe that's why they did the time i don't know but regardless i would much prefer to have a brand and to be uh, have a studio or to be able to do collaborations with brands such as these as opposed to going straight for the big leagues and heading up the nike adidas i'd much prefer to be able to do like a vans a new balance um a ho a, 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 a mohoka right or one one um or whatever timberland do you know what i mean like do all these little other brands footwear brands in that way so that you have a far better portfolio and a range of products that you can offer up to your customers and obviously um different silhouettes and brands that you could basically align yourself with and use the resources of it's a really really cool way to do it i would think obviously you can have a relationship with one brand that can sponsor you going forward but i like this approach the montreal headquarters um, entity took the id to unveil the impending capsule um alongside the caption title jjj van 2021 like the two uh, parties in inaugural batch the newest range also looks to involve three new styles including black brown and green colorways each take looks to be formed with a suede upper mid upper build sorry comes contrasted with exposed um white stitching both of the brown and green pairs are wiped up with white stripes so yeah definitely looking forward to them coming out they'll be hard to come by as per usual you probably have to buy them on the, i think the down site and then maybe some retail partners here and there but yeah great collaboration great collaboration just a shame about the model would prefer to have seen him in the chucker or like i said um a skate high just to be classic but hey i guess you have to kind of break in new models maybe that means that, that maybe this is an indication we're going to see loads more collaborations because whenever they re-debut or kind of you know um bring back models that they've tried to break into a market but it's not really popped off they always link up with a brand and then you see a whole avalanche of other collaborations come through too oh look what they did the laces they did the thing that i love look the detail that i love over over on the left hand side right something that only a sneakerhead would give a shit about but that lace there you see this bit this over on that bit on the left hand side and then on the right foot over on the right side oh it's such a simple detail but that would make all the difference for me in terms of purchasing them it really does i hate product shots where they just leave the laces like they come in the factory relace your shoes make the effort man and stop taking pictures of trainers with pin rolls all the time everywhere and people like balancing on things and about to fly it's just annoying sneaker photography is probably some of the worst photography that ever exists out there it's probably worse than maybe those you know photoshop uh, sorry those facebook studios that people go to you know the ones where the girls sit in the they sit like in a circle on it like you know what i mean like it's so horrendous but yeah this is so much better look at these little details that's what really matters that's what really matters but yeah big up jound um release soon come we've got a date here on hypebeast no idea what the date is check back to find out so yeah keep your ear to the ground Anyway, that's the Action Show, episode number 462. Thanks so much for tuning in. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And of course, support via Patreon. It's always more than welcome for the bonus show and all that malarkey. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.